Hello, I'm Roy Richardson, and this is the Dynamic Business Leaders Podcast. Welcome to this week's edition of the Dynamic Business Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Roy Richardson. The Dynamic Business Leaders Podcast is brought to you by Aurora Infotech, a cybersecurity firm specializing in the information security needs of small to medium-sized businesses throughout Central Florida. Folks, my guest today is an award-winning concert lighting designer and director for rock bands. He has done lighting for over 40 acts, most notably ACDC, Aerospit, Foreigner, NXS, the Rolling Stones, the Scorpions, and many, many more. He is known for his vintage lighting designs and wearing Hawaiian shirts, and he's quite the food connoisseur and a history buff. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Cosmo Wilson to our podcast. Cosmo, it's, it's, it's great to have you here with us today. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I, I feel honored that you had me on uh, one of your podcasts. I'm, I'm really the, the honor is all mine. The honor is all mine. I'm looking forward to reliving some of uh, some of my 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 music loving days. I would say <laughs> the earlier days through through you um, here. <laughs> so so uh, Cosmo, I, I I got a question. You know, I've 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 I looked through your your Wikipedia. And, you know, you've had the opportunity to work with many, many acts, some incredibly popular ones. I mean, I recognize a lot of the names on there. Mm -hmm. And as I'm going through your list, I can actually hear the songs popping through yeah. my head, you know, you know, and, and, and let me let me just give a, a, a the, the audience here, the listening audience. Uh, let me just throw out a couple of the names there. I throw out some in the introduction, but, you know, you have ACDC, Aerosmith, American Idols live tour for 2003 and 2004. If I keep on going down here and I'm skipping over folks, some foreigner, which we mentioned, Gloria Stefan, Guns N' Roses, um, John Cicada, Judas Priest, uh, Meatloaf, uh, Rolling Stones, you know, Steel Pulse, uh, Twisted Sister, Van Halen, White Snake, and so the list goes on. Um, tell us, you know, how did you get started in the music industry and specifically in lighting and the lighting design business? Well, I mean, it's 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 funny. I think most guys on the road like me, you know, no matter what your specialty is, whether you're a lighting, sound, backline technician, I think most of us are, uh, I say, frustrated musicians. We all wanted to be in bands. Some of us, I mean, I was in a band in high school and, and a lot of, you know, we all wanted to be rock stars. Um, and you know, through, for whatever reason, we didn't necessarily end up as a rock star, but I think I'm very fortunate that I get to work with rock stars. Yeah. Um, you know, I started out playing guitar when I was like 10 or 11 or 12, and I was in bands in high school. And I found myself in New York in, uh, in about 1979. And um, I, a friend of mine that I went to high school with had, had said that he was working for a band in New York called Falcon Eddie, which was a fairly big band in New York at the time. And that they needed another, they needed a drum technician is what they needed. Um, so he asked if I had any experience and I lied and said yes. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I did playing in a band, you know, I played around with the drums and I, you know. So I, I went to this first gig and it was at a, it was a, it was a club in New York City called Gildersleeves. And, and, uh, and funny enough, I went there and, and they had two guys that were doing the, you know, setting up all the instruments and the, and the one guy set up the drums and and showed me how to do it and the drummer came and then they played a show and then they finished and they said well it didn't seem to be that much quicker than normal um we're, we're not going to hire you and they gave me five dollars i said hang on a second you didn't give me a chance uh -huh. I, said, I said steve showed me how to set the drums up and he set them up i said i said let me come to the rehearsal loft and, and practice so long story short i i I, uh, I went and i learned the drum kit by heart and i set it up in the next gig the drummer sat down didn't have to move a thing I was hired and my salary was a $30 a night and that was to, for a, for an 18 year old kid. That was a good lot of money. So yeah, back then, so, yeah, prob yeah, probably spread a long way. Yeah. Yeah. So I, and that's what I did. I, and I was a back line tech for, for a few years. Then I moved back down to Florida and the, the way I got into lighting is I started working locally at, as a stagehand, you know, at, the, at Lakeland civic center, you know, orange County convention center, you know, the local uh, arenas and back in the early to mid eighties, the, the arena rock was getting really, really big. So, I just, um, the way I got into lighting was that I, it, they were the first guys to go to work on stage. And otherwise you push boxes until somebody went to work and I didn't want to push boxes. So as soon as I heard them wow. say they need somebody to get on stage and bolt together truss or hang lights, I jumped up on stage. And, uh, you know, as fate would have it, I, I ended up 
you know, working a lot of lighting shows. And I always gave my number to uh, the, the, the touring lighting crew, you know, which they probably just threw it in the trash. And then <laughs> I, uh, you know, finally I got a connection and I got a call to go on the road in 1986. And that's, that's when I started my career, pretty much, is on the road, on the big road, like I said. That's that's pretty interesting. It's a pretty interesting story, and and actually, what I gathered from that is that in several several instances, you created your own opportunities. Because had you just walked away when the you know when the first band said you know we're not we're not going to hire you, um, you know what what. Where, where where would you have have gone and, and do you think or do you ever reflect back on that moment and say hey you know what if i had just walked out that door would that journey would i have been on the journey that i'm on has that ever crossed your mind uh well I, not really it, it's funny i mean it's I, i'm i'm kind of like a free spirit uh but like you said i i don't you, you know I, I i make my own luck that's what they say you make your own yeah. luck yeah. And, you know, I wasn't giving up uh, because I knew I could do it. And the, the one thing that, that about me is I never say no. You know, I'm not going to lie. If I'm sitting on an, an airline and somebody says, can you fly this jet? I'll say, well, I'll try. Uh, <laughs> but but I mean, in most cases, I can figure things out. And, and I'll, you know, I mean, I today the young people have it made with YouTube. You just go look on YouTube and you, you can do it. But right. that's one thing is I never said no. And I, you know, I, I had a lot of confidence and, and uh, I tried, you know, I did my best at everything, but had I not gotten that job, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it was funny because if I hadn't gotten into rock and roll, I wanted to join the air force because I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Nice. Um, but even, even my job on the road, um, you know, when I worked for locally in a stagehand, it was great, but I wanted to go on the road. I wanted to tour the world. You know, I wanted to be on a tour bus and, and just a little, the story about how I got that is another, my whole thing is I put trust and faith into the universe, to make things happen. You just, you just, you just gotta, you gotta listen and keep your eyes open. Yeah. And basically I had just moved from, I, I I'd sold my home. I lived with the, my, at the time, my brother-in-law and his, his wife. And we were staying there until we were getting approved for another home. We didn't get the approval. So we just decided to get an apartment. Well, this is how things happened. The guy that had my that that number that in Dallas the, the, with the lighting company, um, I I I, he, I didn't give him my new number. I gave it to my brother-in-law who was a late sleeper and lost things. I so what had happened is I had taken my car up on Monday morning to get um, the muffler fixed, and my wife at the time called me and said Richard Hartman's on the phone. He's the guy who I was trying to get a job with. Well, the long story short, he called my brother-in-law who happened to be awake, who happened to find the number. And I just moved into my apartment. The phone just happened to be turned on. My wife knew that I was up at Midas Muffler and the, and they got in touch with me. And had I missed that call, I, I don't know if I would have been, ever been on the road. I probably, but that was, you know, talk about the universe aligning. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an amazing event. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's amazing. You, you, you have, you have a lot of stars that are, that are aligned there and, um, um, I, I, I can't wait to delve, uh, tell, delve deeper there. Um, but, you know, story there, I, actually, I should say lesson there, of course, is, you know, never give up, don't take mm -hmm. no, and, and, you know, create your own opportunity. And, and as you said, create your own luck. So tell us a little bit in terms of that transitioning from lightning to becoming a director and, and, and what all that entailed and, and what it entails when, when you go on the road. Well, I mean, that was, you know, that was, so what I did is I transitioned I you know, when I, I was a stagehand, I basically came in and I was a local crew, uh, the traveling crew would come in and we would, you know, they would, they would bring all the gear and we would set it up, you know, hang the lighting and the sound and they we would build the set and put together the instruments and then the band would play and then we would tear it all down, put it back in the truck and they would go off to the next city and I would go home and another show would come. Uh, so when I got transitioned to go on the road, you know, I had experience about putting these systems together, uh, you know, as a local stagehand. But, you know, like I said, I, I, I pay attention. You know, I, I, I knew what I was doing, even though I'd never been on the road. So I flew to Chicago. Uh, the, what had happened is the, the tour that I got called to do was The Cure. And the lighting guys on The Cure had been in Canada and they didn't make it across the border. So they needed somebody immediately to replace them. Uh, so I just came into a show that had already been out. So I got there in the morning, you know, I flew, flew into Chicago, got there. I uh, proceeded to put together the lighting trust with the help of the lighting designer and director at the time. And, uh, you know, I just, in short order, got it up, focused and ready to go. I and mean, then we did another three weeks of, of dates. 
and I did such a great job on that that I got offered the Genesis tour. Uh, it was Invisible Touch in 86 and 87, which at the time was the largest tour in the world. Yeah, yeah. So I was very fortunate to get on that one. I did, I did the same thing. You know, I, I you know, it's, it was, a, it's, it, 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 it's not, it, I'd never traveled like that before, but I, I moved around a lot as a kid. My dad was an architect, so I moved around a lot. So I was prepared for it. Um, and, you know, I just kind of, I keep my mouth shut and I work hard. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, once again, make my own opportunity. I, I would take, a, a, take advantage of every opportunity, um, you know, and, and, and try to do a better job than anybody else. And, and so I did that for a few years on the lighting crew. And I would get one tour after another because everybody liked me. Everybody wanted me. They knew I worked good. Plus, they knew I was a good personality and a good fit. And the way I started running lights was uh, the, uh, generally on, a, on like a headline tour, there's an opening, a support act. And, you know, they don't get paid a lot of money and, and, and they don't have enough money to carry. They carry certain, you know, key members of their crew, mm -hmm. uh, like the sound guy, maybe, or the backline guys, you know, guitar tuners and stuff like that. Uh, but they generally don't carry a lighting guy. So what, for me, it was a great because they would have one of the lighting crew members. They would pay him like 50 or $100 to run the show. So I got, you know, I, I learned how to run a console, you know, a lighting, you know, um, control console. And I was fortunate I had the lighting designers and directors I worked with showed me how to do this stuff. So I started running lights for the opening acts. And uh, then I went out with the Rolling Stones in 1989. Nice. And the LD was a, was a guy named Patrick Woodruff. And he's, a, he's one of the most preeminent LDs in the, in the business. He's been around for quite a while. He's done the Stones for quite a while. Uh, he used to do Rod Stewart. He uh, he's done he does everything from theater to opera to uh, the Oscars. You know, he does stuff like that. But anyway, he um, the, the he was the overall designer. We had a director named Sean Richardson who ran the show, and it was a long show, it was a three-hour show. So I mean, I would run lights for some of the opening acts for the Stones, but most of them are big enough to bring in their own guy. But um, the basically Sean, the director, would have to get up to go pee during the show and. I, he would let me jump on the console and just run the run a song. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't think I saw I didn't realize it at the time because I, I'm, I was an idiot. But you know, who, who knows? But I think they were grooming me to take over because Sean left to do Tina Turner. So we showed up in Japan. We, we had a break after the American leg. We showed up in Japan, and I get there and there's no Sean Richardson. There's no. I said to Patrick, so who's going to run lights? He says, Well, I can run some. I can run some of them, and you can run some of them, can't you? And I said, Oh yeah, sure. I would love to. So we did two shows and each, the first show I did about half, the second show I did almost the whole thing. And, the, and after that night, he said, would you like to carry on and finish the Rolling Stones tour? And I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I took over. But hey, and, and as I said, I, you know, they obviously saw talent in me and they saw they, that I had the ability and, and the drive and ambition. So I, I took over that and I, I did the, uh, the, the Rolling Stones, the rest of the Steel Wheels tour. So that was, that's how I transitioned to become an LD. Nice, nice. So let, let me ask you, I mean, you know, lighting back then, lighting today, um, I'm assuming a lot of probably back in, 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 the, in the early days, a lot of it was, was you know, yourself or, and, and you would have, you'd have to educate me on this, but it was probably a lot of manual work. And today, perhaps more computer driven. Um, what a Explain us a little bit about that. Tell us, you know, what has changed between, you know, your early days to what you're seeing out there today? Well, I, I think the things, you know, I, I started kind of in, not later in the lighting business, but it, basically everything I used was, was the basic lighting systems. I mean, you know, there's the old theatrical lighting system. They had the big, the big okay. switches and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. I mean, I didn't use anything like that. Everything you know, they were control consoles, you know, so it was, you know, faders and buttons. And, you know, I'd actually run light. I worked for bands in the early days before I went on the big road. And I would actually run sound and lighting at the same time. But the lighting console was like some toggle switches, a bump button, maybe a fader or two. So it was relatively, you know, simple. Yeah. Um, even when I came on to the, to, the, to the bigger road, they had much larger consoles. And they were, they were com the computers what changed everything, the, the ability to, I mean, for, to, I'll make this, put this in a nutshell. A, a, a basically, a theatrical console has two scenes. So you can put up 10 lights in one color. And on the other scene, you can put up 10 lights in another color or combination. Okay. And then you just go between the scenes. That's called the two scene lighting console. Well, that's the early consoles. And it worked in theaters when you were doing transitioning between, you know, acts and stuff like that. But rock and roll, you needed stuff that would flash and move yeah. and bump. And, <laughs> so you, you, they made it so you could actually program that scene into a button. 
So you could put up 10 lights and program it into the button. And then you program another 10 lights, put it into another button and so on and so forth. So you could do that as many faders as you had or, or bump buttons as we call them. Um, but what, what, what started occurring is besides the way to control it was the actual lights because the old lights were par cans, which are uh, uh, basically the, 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 the big, uh, wash lights or the big um, yeah, yeah. flood lights. You know, you've seen them at concerts. They, yeah. you know, they put gels in front of them and that changes and it has a color. But basically, you put a gel light, you put a gel in the front of the light and it was one color, and then you had the ability to turn it on and off or in, you know, 50% dim. What really changed the music or the industry in a whole was a, what they call it intelligent lighting or moving lighting, where you had a light that had all these different parameters, pan and tilt, irising. Uh, you could change the color. You you could change. Uh, you could put a gobo in it. Gobo was like a, uh, it, it's a, it's um, yeah, yeah, a gobo is a is a pattern, you know. Okay. So um, so so you had all these different things you could do with the moving light, the intelligent light. Uh, once again, you had a hard time with the console because you had to make it wasn't just a fader. You had all these. You had to control each one of those things. So you you would have to control this this all those parameters of the light. Um, and the early lights were, were simplistic and there might've been eight or 10 parameters. Now some of the lights have 200 parameters. Uh, but what's kept up to it is the consoles are now computerized. So you can, you can program, it's like a whole, an, a whole orchestra. It's, it's, like a, it's like a synthesizer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole orchestra of, on keyboards. Well, me, I have a whole bunch of lights and I can, I can do so much more with so many more lights and, and, and I can do it. I just program what I want into the button. You know, and then you also have people who program a show, um, so it's time coded. So they hit a button and it runs with whatever they act singing. I'm old school, so I want to run it manually because the bands I'm with are old school. And they like it run manually. Nice, nice, nice. I mean, that's that's. Uh, I I can you you were describing that, and I could actually you know I'm I'm picturing the consoles and and uh, and 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 what you know what all needed to be done, etc. And and I mean talk about a transition from, you know, the way it used to be to the way it is today and what, you know, one button used to do, like you call it a bump button back in the day mm -hmm. to what, you know, a bump button would probably do today, right? It's it's a whole bunch of, of automation that's probably behind that. Um, that's great. That's great. So, you know, I, I was reading through your, your Wikipedia and, and I remember that you had shared some photos uh, on social media a while back about the uh, ACDC's uh, Monsters of Rock act at the Toshino Airfield in Moscow that drew over 1.6 million fans and, and is described as being the first free rock concert in Soviet history. Uh, take us on that experience uh, and, and, and what that was like. Well, that was, that was, that was incredible. I mean, it, it, was, um, it was shortly after um, they had the coup uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in Russia. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, this was 1991. The wall had just come down in, at the end of 89. Um, so there was a huge transition there. You know, and the, and the wall mainly came down in Germany. I mean, Russia was still the Soviet Union. Um, and then they had the coup. Unfortunately, it was a peaceful coup. And the mayor of Moscow, see, we were on tour in Europe. Uh, it was a Monsters of Rock. And it was ACDC's Monsters of Rock. And we also had a few other bands like Motley Crue and Queensryche, Metallica. And so we were touring Europe anyway. And at the beginning of the tour, the mayor went to the management of ACDC and said, could you bring the tour to Moscow? Um, I would like to give the people of Moscow a gift uh, for, for having a peaceful coup and, and not, you know, having riots and stuff. Yeah. So, um, you know, they, they agreed. And I mean, it was obviously logistically amazing because of, uh, you know, the amount of gear we had, you know, Moscow is very far away. The roads suck. Plus it was, you know, still had the communist iron curtain kind of thing going on about it. So, uh, you know, and as I said, it was still the Soviet Union. It wasn't, I mean, it might've been Russia, but it, you know, we, uh, we weren't sure what to expect. And, and uh, you know, we had, we brought our own stage and we brought our own lighting and sound and everything. Um, and what they did is they, uh, we finished the, we were supposed to finish the tour in Barcelona, Spain. And uh, then they added Moscow. So you can imagine Moscow, Barcelona and Moscow was quite a way. So the trucks, yeah. <laughs> I think some of the trucks drove, but what they did is they sent two Antonovs. Uh -huh. We loaded them with gear and trucks and they, they did like three trips and wow. brought all the gear to Moscow. Um, and then we flew to Moscow and, you know, coming into, you know, I've been to East Germany and stuff like that, but I'd never been into Moscow. We, we arrived at like at four in the morning. So it was eerie, uh, you know, it was such an incredible experience. 
And uh, so we landed and we get to our hotel at seven in the morning and it's right on Red Square. And, and I go out and, there, and uh, you know, I walk and I see the, I see Red Square. I see Saint, I see Saint Basil's Cathedral and the, they're doing the changing of the guard at Lennon's tomb. I mean, it was, I never imagined myself you know, as a child or as a kid uh, going, standing in Red Square. I mean, you know, that was right. like another planet, you know? So, so we did that. And then we went to this airfield and we loaded in and uh, it was, it was an incredible, incredible experience. And to see, you suddenly realize that the politics aside, we're all people, you know, yeah. we all enjoy the same thing. It was, that was, that was amazing as well. I mean, it was a, it was there there for about three days, but it seems, it seems like a minute and it seems like a month. I mean, it's such, so many things happen. So, so let me ask you when, when you, when you, when you guys got to Moscow, when you were on your way to the airfield, did you have any idea at that moment or prior to that, that there would be this, you know, mass amount of people uh, who were coming out to celebrate your, your, uh, your act? No, I mean, we, we knew it was going to be a lot of people. We, there was at an airfield, so we knew, but we didn't. We they didn't say anything about numbers. I mean, you know, I think we we done we we've done shows a hundred thousand or hundred twenty thousand as the biggest we we did, and that was rare. Mostly it was you know sixty eighty thousand. I mean, so it's a lot right. of people. Um, you know, and we didn't even know at the time, but as as the day progressed, when we got there in the morning, we saw the people, and then, and it kept they kept coming and I actually got one of the a Russian helicopter, a Soviet helicopter flew over the crowd. And it was just mind boggling to see this many people to come and see ACDC. And, and you felt so good, you know, I mean, I'm not in the band or anything, but it, to be part of that, you felt so good bringing this happiness and joy to, yeah. to these people, you know, who, you know, I mean, you know, it's great going to a concert anyway. And you know, I've seen all the people having a good time, but to bring that to people who'd never really been to a concert in their entire lives, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can imagine, I can imagine, I can, I mean, I mean, I like I said, I, I saw that the pictures that you, you, uh, you shared, and then you shared some stories also. I, I'm, I'm trying to recall, but there, there was, wasn't it, wasn't it, wasn't there an aircraft or something that that you and some of your your comrades went to check out? It was, um, well, space you know, captain. I'm, a, I'm a space captain. I'm a big yes. space buff. I'm a big airplane fanatic. Um, and they had this kind of like it wasn't a museum, but they had these kind of relics sitting in this field. Uh -huh. And I'm standing on stage and I'm looking over there and there's some airplanes and I see it looks like um, um, a space cap, you know, round Russian, you know, like what Yuri Gagarin went in. Uh -huh. And I said, I got to go check this out. So I went over to see it. It was just sitting there in the middle of the field and you, you, they, you didn't, they didn't really let you walk up to it. But, you, but I walked up to it and I, I took some video of it and I was like, wow. Um, and on the door, there were these bolts, but they were big bolts. Uh -huh. And I went up to them and I... I realized they were loose. They were a couple of them were loose. And I thought, boy, I might be able to take this door off and look inside. Um, and there was, you know, there was, there were soldiers everywhere with guns and stuff. And so I didn't want to be too, you know, obvious. Uh -huh. um, so I went, I couldn't find a, a wrench big enough to do the bolts, but the, the, the staging company has big bolts on the stage and the roof and all that. So I asked them if I could borrow a wrench and, you know, big, huge wrench. And so I went over there and a couple of the guys in the crew, you know, like three or four of us went over, they said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to take the door off that thing. So I went over there and uh, we started taking the door off. The van's on stage. I think Metallic is on stage at this point. So we're not working. So this, all the you know, soldiers hadn't seen stuff like this before. So they're watching. So they see us. So one of the guys looks over there and he tells us to get away. So we kind of go away and hide from it. And the minute he goes back and watches the concert, we go back and start taking the nut, nuts off again. Um, and we get, the, we get the wrench and we're taking the, the, the bolts off. And then he sees this again. Then he starts coming over with the gun. And we think, well, so we run away, wait for a few minutes. He goes back. So finally, this time we're almost there. We get the bolts off. Or it's getting dusk. So we're kind of hiding in the dark and there's kind of high weeds around. So we finally get the last bolt off and we just, we're giddy, you know? So we, we get our fingers underneath the door and you know, it's, it's tight. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're pulling on the door. We're trying to, you know, wiggle it back and forth. Finally, we pull on it. And, and the door, whole door comes off. I mean, you know, it's a big door. It's probably three, three feet wide. It falls off on top of us. We land on, we land on the ground and we jump up to see what's inside. Another door. <laughs> so, but this one had huge bolts. And I thought there's no way we're going to get those off. And by that time, the security saw us. So we just took off running. And, but it was a great moment, you know. It was a Russian spacecraft. <laughs> that was amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, you know, throughout all your, your tours and the different acts you've been on, et cetera, 
you know, what would you say is, you know, if you had to think back, what, what was, what, what was one of the most challenging for you and why? Well, I, as, as far as challenge, overall challenging, you know, that's the thing about the entertainment industry, show business, the show must go on. So, um, you know, you, there's things that you can put off as rain outs. There's certain things that happen, but in a rock and not even just rock and roll in show business period, the show must go on, you know, whether it's the circus, whether it's, you know, so you, I think the one thing about my business is you think differently. Um, you have to come up with a solution. You have to think fast on your feet. Um, uh, because the show is going to happen. You know, of course, there, there, there could be technical difficulties where, you know, it's not going to happen. But we're, we kind of pride ourselves on being able to make it happen, you know, regardless. I mean, you know, I've had shows where we've lost power and the singer will sing a cappella or get an acoustic guitar and they'll finish, you know. And that's almost, is it what the audience paid for? Well, no, but on, on one hand, but on the other hand, they're making the best of a bad situation. Number one, yeah, that's two, true. the audience are seeing something they've never seen and nobody sees. Yeah. You know, so you kind of turn it around. And that's the thing about my business. We make it happen. I mean, you know, we, we usually load in at seven or eight in the morning. You know, I can't tell you how many times that the bus has gotten a flat, the truck has had a wreck and we're, we're rolling in. It's, you know, it's four or five, six o'clock in the evening. We still get the rig up, get, the, get everything going and we have a show. Um, you know, it's rare that it gets canceled or postponed, but, but but we make it happen. Nice, nice. So what advice would you have for, you know, if a member of the our audience is out there listening and, and they're piqued by your interest and your journey, you know, today in today's day and age, you know, what advice would, would you have for someone looking to get into a similar field of work today, be it either, you know, on the lighting side or being a designer or a director, et cetera, you know, where should they start and what are some important steps they, they need to, you know, undertake along in their, in their journey? Well, I mean, the, the first thing I'll say, and I, I guess when I get asked this question, you know, similar questions is, it, there's got to be a drive and ambition, passion, 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 passion. You know, I, it, it, I'm, I'm in it, you know, music, you know, I'm in it because of music. Like I said, I'm a frustrated musician, you know, but I just, I love everything to do with, you know, that it's the, it's my passion is putting on a show, um, you know, and, and same with the musicians, you know, same with every person on every department. But I think, so as long as you have that, that'll push you, that will push you to get, um, to, to, to succeed. Uh, there's so many ways to, uh, to, to get, I mean, you know, I'm, I, I learned on the street, as they say, you know, I, I was raised mm -hmm. on the street coming up, you know, I learned by doing, I didn't go to school, there was no technical school, um, you know, hard work, obviously, is, is important. Uh, there are schools now, and I, 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 I recommend schools are good, because they give you a, um, an idea of, like, like, there's one in Orlando called Full Sail. Yeah. And their, their production and they show you everything from lighting to sound to video, uh, which kind of helps you understand every department, you know, every every part of a production. Um, you may end up in television, you may end up on the on the on the road, you may end up doing movies, but it's it's all the same entertainment business. Um, but I think, and this is what I tell especially younger people when they want to get into, especially if they say, oh, how do I get into lighting? Uh, you know, how, obviously in your if you're in high school get in with the, you know, the, if you have an auditorium that puts on shows, get on that team. Right. Uh, you know, the local union has a, you know, the, like in Orlando, there's, a, there's a, the, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. They're all over the, they're all over the world, mainly in the United States. And they do, you know, all the Broadway shows, they do all the movies, they do every, most arenas, theaters, they, they're the crew. So you go in, you know, it's hard to get into a union and stuff, but you know, some unions are looking for people. But, you know, I, I say go to a club, you know, go to a, a venue, any kind of venue where they have it. And, and I'm not, I, don't, I don't suggest working for free, but, you know, you, you, you show the interest and you get somebody there and maybe they'll hire you to come in to carry things and you learn. Um, but it, it's, it's, and that just comes from the passion. It's like me. I just did everything I possibly could. I never said no. You know, when they said, can you tune a guitar? Can you do this? Can you do that? I never said no. And, uh, and, I, and I would learn it or, I, I, you know, I, as I said, I didn't put myself in a position where I looked like a fool. Um, but but I think what I the advice I give the young people is is look around where this is happening. Don't try to get a job on the road with with the, the Rolling Stones. Uh, not that it can't happen, but you've got to get experience and knowledge. Um, and 
you know, like I did. I mean, I worked in New York as a guitar tech, then I worked in Florida as a stagehand. And then I went on the road as a lighting crew guy, then I ended up as an LD, you know? So th that's the whole thing is, uh, but it started with my passion, you know? And, and uh, it's, it's, you know, you know, I, I didn't want to run away and join the circus. I wanted to be, in, and I guess I sort of did, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I know what you're saying. And, but you know, it, it's, it's so, look, what, what you just described there is, is what is really, you know, uh, I would say, and regardless of your industry, right? Um, you need to have passion and drive and, and create your own moment and create your own luck in some cases, which, which is, you know, when, when I listen to your story um, is what, what you did. And because you didn't say no, and, and because you, you, you challenge yourself, even if you didn't know, you went and you challenge yourself to learn, but like right. you said, didn't put yourself in a position where you made a fool of yourself. I see nowadays as, as you know, a lot of, I would say, and not to, not to sort of classify between, you know, older generations and younger generations, but a lot of the kids nowadays, I would think I see, I should say, excuse me. Um, I see more of, uh, you know, how do I get from zero to 100 very quickly without having to go through all those those steps without having to really learn the ropes and learn the industry that I'm going into um, uh, you know they, they, and unfortunately a lot of a lot of them don't want to put in that extra um, uh, they don't have the passion I think I is, is what it really comes down to then again I've met some that that are really really passionate and once again regardless of what industry they're in they're they're you know they're knocking it out of the park so that's very good advice. I um, thank you for sharing that with uh, with our audience. So let me let me ask you here. Um, you know, if 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 there was one thing you could change on your journey, um, what would it be, and why would you change it? Well, it, it's funny. You know that that's my journey is my journey, and it's and it's led me to where I'm. I mean, you know, do I look? Here's the first thing. I don't have any regrets. You know, I, I have, you know, my, one, one of my mantras um, is there's no such thing as a wrong decision. Yeah. And what I mean by that, I mean, of course, there's a you know, wrong decision in the sense of I should have done that. I should have done this. But that decision, even if it was wrong, you learn. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a wrong decision because you learn from it. Um, and, the, and it actually it makes my makes my life so much easier when I when I, I don't have to I don't lament and sweat and go, oh, my God, what am I going to do? I make the decision and, and then I live with it. And uh, I also find that in my life that most decisions that I sweat over kind of get made for me. Um, but as far as changing, I mean, you know, okay, let's, let's simplify it. I wish I would have saved more money. I wish I would have put more money in the stock market 40 years ago. I mean, you know, that kind of stuff on one hand. But on the other hand, I think I'm here where I'm at right now and I'm, I'm, I, I'm happy. I'm content. I mean, you know, there's things I want and things I would need and things I like, but that's the whole thing. If, if I would have put all, if I would have $10 million in the bank right now, what would I be doing? Right. You know, the right. nice thing about, about it, there's a drive. I mean, even people who are rich still have a drive to do something. Um, my, my drive isn't money. And I could say that I wish I would have, you know, I mean, I still did put money away and stuff like that, but you, you look back and you think, oh, I, you know, I could have, you know, I could have become a millionaire if I would have, you know, bought Apple stock or Bitcoin or, but on the other hand, my journey brought me to where I'm at right now. And I'm very, I'm very content and, and happy with where I'm at. So I don't think I changed anything, you know, because I don't know, I don't know if it would make me happier. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? I'm, no, that, I hear you. I hear you. That's me. I'm content with where I am. No, I, you know, I, I asked that question. And to be honest with you, I, I don't think that even with, you know, I look back on my life, I, I wouldn't change anything either. I mean, look, you know, I, I always, I always, uh, I, I say to people when, when that question is asked of me is, you know, if I changed something back then, I may not be here speaking to you right now, you know, exactly. because, you know, um, that's just the way life is. Uh, we, we learn from our past. I, I reflect back on my past. I, you know, there's not a day that doesn't go by. And sometimes I, you know, I shake my head and say, well, you know, I could have done that better. But for me, that's maturity, right? You're, we're realizing things that we could have, and uh, we, we know how to handle it moving forward. So let me ask you here, um, you know, throughout all your, your career, how many countries do you think you've been through? Well, I, I've about 83. I, I, I have kept count. Um, and I think it's 83 or so, maybe more, not less, but definitely 83. Favorite and why? Okay, um, that's a good question. I'm asked that a lot. And um, I have, here's the thing. 
I like something about every place I've been to. Um, right. I like um, when I was a kid, mm -hmm. I would see movies and read books. Um, I actually had uh, these books that they were um, they were like an, they were they would get one every month. It was like Science Club. Uh, this is the Geographic Club, and they would send you a month every month. They would send you a book in a different country. It had stickers in it. And you would put you know colored stickers in. Yeah, yeah. And there are photos. And, and, I, and I looked at this and I thought, man, I would love to travel to these places. I wanted to go to Pompeii. I wanted to go to England. I wanted to go to Germany. I wanted to go to all these places. But for me, they, they, they only existed in books and on TV. And so I wanted to go there and feel it and, and experience it. Um, it. It's funny, the first time I went to Germany, I've always had a fascination. I love Germany. I love German food. You know, I'm a, I'm a World War II buff. Uh, the first time I went to Munich, I, I went to the Marienplatz, which is right in the center of the city, the, the main square. And it was the first time I felt, it was really weird. It was like, I felt I was home. It was the strangest feeling I've ever had. And at that point in time, this is 1986, I said, I'm going to live here one day. And uh, long story short, I got, a, I got a flat. I got an apartment there in the early 2000s for about four years. And I didn't live there full time, but I you know, still had my home in Florida, but I lived there quite a bit. So I ended up living that dream. But I, I love Germany. I love the German people. I love German food. I love German beer. Um, you know, I, as I said, though, I, I love, there's something about every country, you know, I, I love. I love, there's a, two of my favorite places is Munich. Another place is in the, outside of Sao Paulo, Brazil, in the rainforest near the ocean. It's just, it's just incredible. It is, it is remote. It is the rainforest. There's a waterfall that's about a mile high from this cabin that I stay in. Nice. And that's an amazing place. You know, I could get lost and, and never come home from that place sometimes. Nice, nice. So, so with your, with your travels, um, and thank you for sharing that with us, and with your, with your travels, um, you must have, you know, I would say, I know you're, I know you're, you're a, a, a food connoisseur, mm -hmm. but you, may, you must have tasted, uh, your palate must have been exposed to many different foods. So, you know, tell us, take us a little bit on that journey about being a food connoisseur and, you know, what's your, what's your favorite food? Well, again, like what's my favorite country? I mean, I, well, here's the thing I tend to do when I go to countries, I want to eat the local cuisine. Yeah. Um, and generally I'll ask, like, if I'm in a hotel, I'll go to the concierge or go to, you know, somebody in the staff and I'll say, I'm looking for a good local food restaurant. And they'll tell me this place. And I'll say one caveat where would you go? And they'll go, ah, and they'll tell me a place that they go, this little hole in the wall place. And that's important to me because that, that's tasting local, you know, and, and uh, I have, you know, I've, great, I've, I've got a lot of friends around the world now and, and I'm very fortunate because I get to go out with them and they take me to their places. And, and actually now when I'm on the road, I take the crew, you know, there'll be people on the crew that I take out with me and I go to the places that I've been going to for years and turn them on to it, you know, pay it forward. Nice, as for it. nice. yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, I love... Uh, okay in germany i you know, i love bratwurst and i love the beer um in england oddly enough i, I love indian food it, it's just uh, you know i love fish and chips yeah uh, i love shepherd's uh, shepherd's pie and bangers and mash and stuff like that but indian food in england is like none other as you know um yeah i love yeah. argentina for the steaks although i, I thought it, argentina had the best steaks until i went to uruguay and they're even twice as, better, as good as Argentina. I couldn't believe that. And I'm a sushi connoisseur. So it's Japan and, you know, ramen noodles. And, you know, I can go on and on. Every country I, I appreciate, I appreciate the cuisine. Nice, nice. And, uh, and, and, and so tell us a little bit about, you know, I'm, I'm going down some fun facts here. Um, I, you are also a Hawaiian shirt connoisseur. <laughs> I would say maybe not a connoisseur, but you love Hawaiian shirts. How, how did that come about? Well, I mean, you know, I was born in Florida and I was raised in New York and Chicago, but I always had a home in Florida. Yeah. And um, I just, I started, I wore them as a kid, as you do, you wear them at the beach and stuff like that, like everybody does, you know, and um, you have three or four in your closet or maybe ones, you know. Um, but when I went on the road, you know, when I was a crew guy, I mean, I had like a Hawaiian shirt for my day off and stuff. I couldn't work in it because I was climbing trusses. So I'd have a, a tight t-shirt so I wouldn't get caught on things. But as I become an LD, you know, I'm a bright and cheerful and sunshiny and colorful guy anyway. And my lighting, you know, the lighting I do for bands is, is, is colorful and bright. And I thought, what a good reflection of, of me from the inside. What a good reflection of the job I do. And, and it's also, a, it, it's, it's funny how it really, peep, I get more comments on my shirt from, from st absolute strangers sometimes 
you know, because not everybody wears them. And, you know, you yeah. see that you go to Hawaii and you see them, you, you see them at the beach, but when you're in certain places, they go, wow, that's a great shirt. You know, it kind of gives, it, it's kind of a happy free feeling, you know, when, when people see you wearing a Hawaiian shirt. And, and as I said, it reflects my personality. So nice. I've been, I've been wearing them a long time and I probably have 300 in my closet. Holy 300. Wow. 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 That's a, that's quite a closet there, Cosmo. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Cosmo, uh, in terms of, you know, sharing some knowledge here with, with our audience, um, you know, what, what are, what if any are some books you've read along the way that, you know, have sort of influenced your journey and maybe a nugget from each, maybe one or two, um, you know, my, my, my audience likes to, we, we tend, we tend to put that down in the podcast and, and they, they tend to check it out. Well, I mean, the, the first book I read that I really made an impact on me, uh, when I was young, I was probably say early teens, 13, 14, 15, uh, which is amazing that I read a book like this at that, at that age, but was a uh, Dale Carnegie's, uh, how to win friends and influence people. You know, that, that book was huge, you know, and I still have the original book, you know, and I think the book that I have is probably from one of the first editions that I got from my mom or somebody, but it's, uh, that right there, that, that taught me a lot, um, uh, you know, uh, about life and how to deal with people. Um, you know, and I, there's, I, I could, you know, there's i uh, I'm trying to think, I, I think there's a the money. Oh yeah. This book. I mean, here's a book here. I just happen to have here think and grow rich, you know, stuff like that, mm -hmm. any kind of self-help books, but I got to say the one book that changed my life. Um, and it wasn't that long ago was the book called the secret. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that book, yep, yep, um, yep. but um, you know, for me, that book, I'll tell you how I found out about it. And this is how the universe works is I don't watch TV. I'm not a big TV guy. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, I don't even listen to that much music because I listen to music all the time. I listen to talk radio. I do listen to music a little bit. You know, I used to watch the news, um, but I didn't, you know, the last time I watched television was when MASH was on, you know, that's, it's been a long time. So <laughs> I've never been a big TV guy. I have a TV. I've always had a TV. But one day I turned the TV on for some stupid reason and at four o'clock in the afternoon, and this is probably nearly 20 years ago, and Oprah Winfrey was on and she had the author of The Secret. And I watched it and it, it was like, oh, I got to get this book, you know, because I never realized, you know, The, the Secret basically is about the, the fact that you, you, like you said, you make your, you make your own reality you make uh, yeah. you, you know you make your own opportunity and so i ordered the book and i and i got it and i couldn't believe page after page how i'd been using the secret my whole life and but never realized it you know i always for lack of a better word commune with the universe i'm always positivity to me gratitude uh so anyway i don't don't mean to go off on that tangent yet, no, no, please please please, please share with us please the share secret with us. to me was um a change in my life I, I, another book um, uh, that changed my life right before The Secret, it's funny how this led to this, is a, a Joel Osteen. You love mm -hmm. him or hate him. He wrote this book called um, Your, Your Best Life Now. And I got that book. It's funny how this happened. I was in a situation, I was in a very frustrated situation with Foreigner. Uh, we were doing a show and we were, we were doing an overnighter, literally from Little Rock to Minneapolis. So we had a show the first night in Little Rock and the next night in Minneapolis, our plane was delayed, it broke down twice. And I'll never forget, I went into the bookstore and I was looking at the books and I saw this book, Joel Osteen. And I almost picked it up and I didn't. And I got back on the plane and then it broke down again. And I was so mad and I went back in the bookstore and there was a the book again and said, something said, buy that book. And what that book kind of, it kind of led me into the secret, but what that book did for me, um, I'm a spiritual guy and the same, you know, I'm, I'm I'm spiritual, not religious and stuff like that. I believe in God and everything, but it basically the, the premise of the book is that, that God loves you. You know, there's this, when we're growing up, you know, the fear of God, the fear of God, the fear of God, and that's not, you know, and, it, but, but the book told me it's all right to, to, to be who you are. Um, and you're not going to get punished for, 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 for not doing your best life. You're, you need to do your best for you, um, right? Right. You know, and, and that's and that's that's kind of what I got from that book is that, you know, it was all about love and that God loves you no matter what you do, and I thought well, that that changes things because, um, I was a very positive person, but then I got the secret and that told me, that led into um, the fact that you make your own reality, you make your own opportunity, 
the positivity, gratitude. And as I said, I've always been gra- full of gratitude. You know, I've always been thankful for the things that I have. And, you know, but anyway, that's that, that book, The Secret probably had more uh, impact on me than any other book, you know, I've ever, I've ever read. And, and that's how I live my life. Thanks to that book. Well, amen to that. Uh, you know, I, I, I can tell you that my, uh, my wife always says, and she, first of all, she, she loves, uh, we, we both do, uh, Joel Osteen, uh, and uh, she's also uh, read The Secret. And um, one, one thing is, of course, you know, you need, you need to, and you mentioned just now about, uh, about the whole, you know, the fear of God and, and different things like that. But, you know, you have to love yourself before you can love others and, and, and you know, create that, that positive realm around you. So thanks for sharing that, uh, Cosmo. I appreciate it. So let me ask you here before we're, we're rounding up the top of our, our podcast here. And if I could ask you, I, I, I got about two more uh, questions here for you before we, uh, before we close out. Um, you know, in all your travels and, and, and being on, with, on the road and with different acts, et cetera, if, you know, and, and I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here, but I would say out of all the shows you had, what, what was what was the most fun and favorite one for you? Uh, we, <laughs> like my countries and like the food. I mean, I I I like them. I'm very fortunate. I, first of all, I work with bands that I listen to. Yeah. Um, you know, it's I I could be offered country acts. I could be offered you know bands that I don't care for the music or and I shouldn't even say that because I like any. I mean, I like Frank Sinatra to Metallica. Yeah. Um, but. Um, ACDC is is such a great band. They're probably the probably the greatest band I've ever worked with because they are so down to earth. Um, it, it, their music is 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 so great. Uh, they are um, they're like my family. I, you know, you, you become family with everybody you tour with. But um, ACDC just treats their crew great. Every tour they do, they 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 have the production manager. Get in touch with every person who was on the previous tour, uh, because the, it's, it's not superstitious as much as they want the people to come back that were surrounding them, making their show good, and they because they want they want to carry on even if it's four or five years later. Oh, that's nice. Um, so they're great. And another band I got, I got. I mean, the Scorpions. I've probably been to more countries with the Scorpions than any every other band combined. I mean, they're they're a band that like touring. Here's a big difference. ACDC does a big show, but unfortunately, a big show you can only bring to certain places because of the yeah. logistics and the you know the cost. Un- of all. Unless you have three Antonovs. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> so, so the ACDC wants to bring the full show because that's as they say, this is what the the kids expect, the fans expect, the full ACDC show. So they bring that show. They 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 don't want to give anything less than what the, the fans deserve. Scorpions, on the other hand, it's not that they don't want to. They they don't. They're not known for their big production. They're known for their music. Yeah. So they can play small towns and hamlets and and bring the music. They don't have to bring the full production. They they can bring, you know, the basic, you know, band gear, drum kit, you know, amplifier. You know, they can get they get as much stuff locally. So we've played, you know, so many countries, you know, in so many small places because they could. So that that's the cool thing about the Scorpions is 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 they get they they play, they bring they try to bring the music to more people. Uh, you know, and a little shout out to Crowded House. Uh, I worked with them in 1988. And talk about a great, actually 80, 89, a great bunch of guys, just really, really, really good people. And, and uh, I still maintain a friendship with them to this day. I mean, I maintain a friendship with most bands I work with, but, but uh, yeah, just uh, most bands, they're really generally good people, you know, they're great to be with. And, and uh, nice, you know, nice, nice. Well, thanks for sharing that. And sorry that I put you on the spot there, but you know, oh, that, good. that's <laughs> hot, hot seat moment, hot seat <laughs> moment, we call it. <laughs> so, you know, um, so Cosmo, if, if you could, you know, looking at where you, where you started and, and where you, you know, all your, your, your exposure and, and uh, your, your path that you travel, your journey, I would say, not exposure, but your journey. Um, if you could assemble today a dream team of advisors, um, you know, the, the Cosmo team uh, could be people dead or alive. You know, let's say if you had three to choose from, who would they who would they be and and why would you choose them well you know it's i you get asked i i've been asked questions similar to you know i've never it's never been uh, as a dream team i mean i have i have a lot of people i admire and look up to especially i mean i like 
I'm a big fan of the military because the, the, they're the salt of the earth. I mean, they put their lives on the line. You know, Chuck Yeager, I, I, I loved. I thought, what a hero. What a, what a you know, yeah. the, guy, the guy was incredible. But, you know, I, I was asked a question, I, 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 um, I don't know, a few, few months ago about a, a similar question. And, and the one, the, 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 I'll name a couple of names from this and I'll name a couple of other names, but two, the two people that started the United States of America, George Washington, you know, Benjamin Franklin, you know, those, those guys, I mean, talk about, I mean, a lot of people in the, in the world in history, those guys had a vision and, and you know, granted the United States of America has issues and especially right now and stuff. But on the other hand, what they created is something unlike anything that's ever been on, on this earth period, you know, and, and uh, the, the idea they had, the way they set it up, you know, I, I would, you know, love to have those guys on my team because I mean, they talk about foresight and, and vision um, and, and intelligence. I mean, you know, those, those guys, you know, alone and I, and I'm, I'm, I liked um, I like people like Ronald Reagan, you know, uh, in, uh, another uh, a patriot of, of America, you know, people who see the best, in, in not just America, but in, in other people, and and have a, the foresight and the vision, you know. So, um, you know, I, and I love people like Mark Twain. You know, I'd love Mark Twain on my team because talk about not only was he intelligent and visionary, but he was funny. You know, and, and he could, you know, that's the kind of person you need that, you know, seriousness aside, sometimes you need somebody, you need somebody to make fun, even of yourself. Yeah. You know, so, so it's, it's, um, you know, stuff like that, you know, there's, there's been generals to the past and, but, but like I said, the, the, the founders of our country, I, I think would, would, I would love to have on my team. Awesome. Well, I, you know, that, that's, um, first I, I, that's a, that's a, that's a beautiful team there. Um, and yes, you know, hats off to our military and to, to every, you know, man and woman out there in the military who have, who make sacrifices or have made sacrifices for this beautiful country that, that we're in, um, that we call home. And, and yes, to have George Washington, Ben Franklin, Ronald Reagan, you know, the big Gipper himself and, and Mark Twain. I mean, that, that's a, that's a pretty impressive, uh, board there that, uh, that, that I, um, I, I would, uh, I would love to, I would love to be a, a fly on the wall and, uh, and, and that this, <laughs> that board meeting, <laughs> that's great. Well, um, you know, Cosmo, I, I, if, if some, Body from our audience wanted to reach out to you and get in touch with you, or you know, you know, get some some you know mentoring or direction in terms of you know getting, you know, in the music industry or lighting industry, etc. How how best would they be able to reach you? My my email my my uh, my Cosmo at ldcosmo.com is is a is a good email for that. Okay, good. So, and we'll we'll put we'll put that uh, that information down in the podcast here. So, um, Cosmo, I would, I wanted to thank you very very much for spending time with us today and taking us through a journey of uh, of of you know your your journey. I would say of of you know um, you know from from where you started to to where you know to from 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 that moment where where you where you could have just walked off of that set and, and not challenge, you know, them to, to, uh, to, to listen to you during practice to all the other opportunities and some of the tours. I mean, I felt like I was there with you. So thank you very, very much for sharing this journey with us. Thank you for your inspiration uh, and the life moments that, that, uh, that you've shared and, and, you know, allowing us to be part of, uh, of your beliefs and, and, uh, and your way of being. I truly appreciate you, and uh, and I look forward to having you back here with us sometime in the future to share more. But thank you very, very much. This has been great. I would love that, and I appreciate it. And, and you know, it, to me, it's very important to be inspirational. And you know, like it's I, I, you know, the old saying, paying it forward. I I I like like helping, you know, people. You know, not just not just in the business, but just life in general. You know, it, it's yeah. like I said, it's about you know gratitude and. And the one thing I will say is that it's it's all about faith, you know, faith in yourself and faith that the universe is going to give you what you need and want. And and that's and that's it's 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 good to be have have uh, social outlets like this uh, to 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 share. And I appreciate you uh, bringing me on. Well, I I can tell you that you are you are certainly 
have been uh, and, and continue, will continue to be an inspiration to many. And I know that our audience will certainly appreciate. Um, I've been inspired just spending the last hour here with you and uh, look forward to spending more in the future. So thank you very, very much. You stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, give your, your beautiful wife the blessings and uh, we'll catch up on the next one soon. Okay, definitely. I, I, and again, I appreciate it and uh, I hope to do this again soon. Thank you. Hi, I'm Roy Richardson, host of the Dynamic Business Leaders Podcast. Are you a business owner or a leader of a successful business? If yes, we'd love to have you as a guest on our podcast. Our goal is simple. We provide a platform for leaders to share their experiences to benefit others. We want to hear your story, how you got started, the challenges you faced along the way, and your passion today. If this sounds like you or if you know someone who fits the criteria, then be sure to visit our website at dynbizpodcast.aurora-infotech.com. That's dynbizpodcast.aurora-infotech.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell to be notified when our next podcast video is live. Or if you rather listen to us during your car ride, you can also follow us on your favorite audio channel using the corresponding links below. Thanks, and once again, keep crushing it.